Good evening, Dr. Littman. Good evening. I, I wish I was in Jamaica, so I figured I'd wear my closest Jamaican outfit. Well, you know, it works. If you didn't tell me, I wouldn't have guessed. I would have wanted with tropical paradise in with your fantastic red shirt. Oh, look at that. It's quite festive. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a festive shirt. <laughs> uh, invitation. I want to come. <laughs> of course, listen, I've invited you already, you know. We're just waiting for the, 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 the rest of the, the world to work with us. <laughs> How are you doing, Dr. Littman? Doing great, doing great. I'd be happy to talk just generally about fibroids, just to kind no, of- No, go right ahead. Go right. As a matter of fact, I have, a, I have a question for you that was sent in earlier about fibroids. Somebody was asking about the general um, age group, when they, what, at what age should they start checking for fibroids? Because what they have found out is that um, a lot of times when women find out they have fibroids, they're massive and it's really important and it's causing us to have a and they kind of want to be in a preventative sort of space. So they're asking, what's the age that one should even start checking for fibroids? Well, oftentimes, you know, hopefully patients are following, you know, guidelines about getting regular checkups with their gynecologist. Um, and fibroids, you know, start early. Unfortunately, not only do they disproportionately affect African-American women, African-American women get fibroids that are bigger, more numerous, and start earlier. While most women don't have a fibroid issue um, from before their mid-20s, I've seen teenagers actually with pretty good-sized fibroids. But mm. for the part, it's once you get in your mid-20s, you, you start to see some fibroids, and then they really can hit in the 30s and 40s. Um, but fibroids, just to kind of go simple, fibroids are the most common tumor seen in women. They're benign. They're not cancerous. So they're benign. Mm -hmm. They're very hard and firm to the touch. They're hard as rocks. And sometimes people can actually feel them. They will be picked up during a physical exam with the gynecologist. Sometimes the patients will feel them themselves, depending on where they're located in the uterus. Yes, I can feel mine. If I lie flat on my back and I push on my uterus, I can, I can actually feel one of mine. Yes, they're hard. You're soft and squishy. The fibroids are hard as a rock. So it's right. And they also depending on where they're located, will determine what symptoms that they'll cause. There, there are mm -hmm. three different locations for fibroids. There are ones that are just underneath the lining. Those are called submucosal fibroids. Those are the ones that cause the heavy periods. There are ones that are on the outer part of the uterus, underneath the outer covering. Those are called subserosal. Those are the ones that cause the bulk-related symptoms the pelvic pain, the pressure, urinary frequency, constipation, painful intercourse, sciatica, radiating buttock and back pain down the legs, the bulk right. of symptoms, those are, and then the intramural, the most common are in between. And they can, they're in the muscle of the uterus, the kind of the meat, the middle. They can grow in either direction. So they can, if they grow outwardly, they behave and cause more bulk symptoms. If they grow inwardly toward the cavity, they tend to cause more bleeding or they grow in both directions and cause both. So based on location, that'll often determine what symptoms. Now you, right. you mentioned the big three symptoms are heavy bleeding, as you mentioned, pelvic pain and pressure and increased urinary frequency and waking up at night. The fibroids say for those women, like the frequency, the frequent urination, those fibroids are on the bladder like a paperweight. Right. And they, <laughs> And so the bladder can't fill to capacity. And so they have to urinate more frequently and wake up at night. The ones right. along the lining stretch the lining, causing these horrific heavy periods that you mentioned, the accidents in blood, soiling mm -hmm. and linens, and wearing two pads at a time, changing crime scene-like periods. I've, I've heard yes. that. Yes, crime so, scene, I swear. Uh, that is the perfect uh, description. None of that is normal. So if you're changing pads more frequently than every three or four hours or changing more than one at a time, or you get clots, um, you can get some occasional small clots, but I'm talking bigger than a quarter clot. Sometimes oh, no. size clots. Some, at one point, I was sure I gave birth. Yes. Like, I, 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 I was like, what is that? Some, some golf ball size business, like some good droplet 
Th those clocks are really heavy for true. So, so none of that is normal. So if you're changing so frequently or you're changing multiple times, um, using multiple, you know, pads and tampons, um, th those things are not normal. If you're having accidents in blood, blood just explodes and gushes and runs down your legs. None of that is normal. And that needs to be brought to the attention of your physician. And so they can look because fibroids are the number one reason why women have heavy periods. So the first thing is recognizing what's abnormal. That's abnormal. It doesn't matter. I understand you got, you, when you were growing up or in your adulthood, you were doing that. And, and a lot of people around you were doing that, but that wasn't yeah. normal. That's abnormal and that needs to be diagnosed as fibroids if that's what the problem is. That's the number one reason why. So recognizing something as being abnormal is, a, is an important first step. Because right. if you continue to bleed like you did, you get anemia, which is essentially a deficit of iron and hemoglobin. And that will lead to very pronounced clinical symptoms. Because if you lose more iron and hemoglobin than you can replace, you'll get tired. I, hemoglobin yes. increases the oxygen around in our blood. So the clinical signs of anemia will be chronic fatigue, weakness, uh, tired, lightheadedness, dizziness, um, migraine-like headaches, brain fog, just not your sharpest thinking. Um, yes. Chew or crave ice, that's a big one. Um, in Georgia, where I'm located in Atlanta, they'll ch sometimes chew Georgia white clay, it's kaolin, it's called pica. They'll chew this crunchy clay, um, but ice is a big one, chewing and craving ice. It's a those are symptoms of significant anemia. And again, those can be corrected by treating the fibroids. The fibroids, as you mentioned, they're right. the problem. You fix the fibroids, your periods go back to normal. You're no longer anemic. You get your life back. Yes. No, but I, I can relate to everything that you said just now, especially when it comes to low energy. Like, I struggled with anemia for years. I mean, I, I used to, I used to just, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be sitting down and I'm working and I stand up and, and the whole place did this and I have to sit right back down. And, and to the point where my doctor was really, really concerned. I had really low iron. My, my, my iron levels were really, really horrible. They're much better now, but I still have to watch them because I struggled with anemia for so long that I still have to watch my iron levels now. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what, what you do, Doc, because um, uterine fibroids um, embolization is not very popular in Jamaica at all. As a matter of fact, after we had our talk, I was asking around about it to see how many persons actually know about it. And it was, it was, they were like, what? So I really wanted to get in depth with you. What, one of the things that I wanted to talk about as well is who is the perfect candidate for UFE? So just tell us a little about what UFE is. And then we can get into who is the perfect candidate for that. Okay. One of the people I just saw scroll by said something about cornstarch. That's another big one. Argo, they chew cornstarch just mm. like they chew the white clay here in Georgia. Just so mm. mention that, that that's a, another good one. Um, UFE, the procedure that I do, is a completely outpatient, non-surgical procedure for fibroids. Uh, it stands for uterine fibroid embolization. It's the same procedure as uterine artery embolization. So you can either, they're interchangeable, UAE or UFE. They're the same procedure. Um, the procedure is performed by an interventional radiologist. That's a, a certain physician. It's different than a gynecologist who's another type of physician. And you'll hear from gynecologists later on. Um, <laughs> it's a procedure that's to say completely outpatient non-surgical patients that are a candidate are if you have fibroids and they're causing symptoms so if you don't have any symptoms um, UFE is not a procedure for you it's it's to treat women that have symptomatic fibroids um, and we see every patient in consultation in the office we get what's called an MRI which is a sophisticated imaging tool it's much better than ultrasound because ultrasound, which a lot of people have had, underestimates the fibroid burden. And we see the fibroids much to much greater detail with an MRI. So they get an MRI, we talk their symptoms, and then if it makes sense, we do this procedure that 
literally they come into my center. It takes about 30 minutes. Um, the approach is at the top of the right leg where you feel your pulse. And I can direct a little tiny catheter into the uterine artery. There are two uterine arteries, one on each side. And I can direct a little catheter into each uterine artery separately. The uterine arteries branch like a tree, getting right. smaller, smaller branches till you get out to the leaves. The fibroids are the leaves of the tree. And I know what size those tiny branches are. And I can flow direct these particles to plug up the branches that are feeding the fibroids. So the big trunk and the main branches of the uterus are open. Um, so the uterus stays alive. And I've had numerous children born after UFE. I've had four. Oh, somebody just asked that question. Can persons get pregnant after UFE? So yes. Absolutely. And our births are typically full term and vaginal. Whereas if you have a surgical myomectomy, you must have a C-section. They won't let you have a vaginal birth. But right. it, it treats every fibroid in the, in the uterus. So um, the procedure is very quick, say 30 minutes, patients sleep to the procedure. There's no general anesthesia. The anesthetic is IV and local, so much nicer. There's about a several hour recovery in our center after, and the patients literally go home with a Band-Aid. That's it, a Band-Aid. Um, UFE is one of the biggest medical breakthroughs for women. I've been doing it for 25 years now, but the biggest problem is that women don't know to ask about it because the, you have to see a different type of doctor. You have to see an interventional radiologist like myself, and they're, they're available all over, but um, most women go to their gynecologist, their surgeons, and surgeons, you know, quite frankly, like to operate. But we work very cooperatively with a lot of gynecologists uh, all around Atlanta and even outside of Atlanta, because I think the patient's best outcomes are when doctors work together cooperatively. Oh, yes. And that's, yes. that's the best, because we can, we can definitely do things. I see way too many people get multiple myomectomies. You can have one myomectomy, but I've seen lots of twos and threes. I've, I've seen up my to... Sister. My and older sister. My older sister has had three myomectomies so far. No reason and, for um, that. I, I, think, I think initially when she started to do it, she wanted to, because she, was, she, she wanted to have a child. And so that's why she was trying to save her womb. I'm not quite sure where she is at that right now or if it's even possible for her to have a child because after three myomectomies, I don't know what state her, her uterus is in. Absolutely. But um, I, that, that, is, that is common. I see, I see people do more than one myomectomies. Uh, I'm just looking at a question here that someone was asking. Can fibroids cause acute urinary retention? Yeah, you, it, it can happen that way. Usually it's urinary frequency by pressing, but sometimes the fibroids can cause urinary retention actually prevent, you know, make it difficult. Sometimes people have to do what's called a crede maneuver, bending over forward and pushing on their bladder to actually empty themselves. Uh -huh. um, well, usually it acts like a paperweight. And so it just doesn't allow the bladder to fill. So they have to go more often repeatedly mm -hmm. and they get tight repeatedly. Right. Um, right. The procedure, the UFE procedure is covered by every insurance. It's well proven safe and effective. In fact, there is more data, medical journal published data on UFE than any other non-surgical procedure for fibroids because we've been doing it for so long, 25 years. All these other things that you might hear about and some of which you'll hear tonight haven't been around very long and we don't have any long-term data on them. Um, but UFEs, the strength of UFE is that it treats no matter how big or how many fibroids you have, it doesn't matter. And it treats all of the fibroids. Myomectomy fails women because you can't surgically cut out all of the fibroids. And so, right. and so they're left with living fibroids in their uterus and those grow and then they're back, you know, within a year, two years, three years. With so that, is the part, that is the part that I think a lot of women are afraid of because they are fine doing a procedure, but then the idea that the fibroids return after after two years is very frustrating because now you have to think about doing this procedure again or finding some other way to deal with the fibroids again and that is something that we're going to definitely address during this this whole thing too because part of the problem is that we 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 want to know from a lifestyle standpoint what are some of the things that cause us to have fibroids to begin with and what are some of the things that we can do differently 
even after we have had a procedure done because I liken it to, to, to cleaning my house. When my house is dirty and I clean my house, how can I keep my house clean so right. I don't get it that dirty again? Right. I'm, I'm kind of the mechanic. When, it, when things break down, they come to me and I fix it. But it's certainly better if you can put the right fuel in Maintain your it. Maintain, do the proper maintenance. Um, you know, that's where things like lifestyle, trying to, you know, nobody knows where fibroids come from, but once they arrive, they grow with estrogen, particularly. That's why they grow rapidly in pregnancy and why they tend not to be an issue once a woman gets to menopause. Estrogen mm -hmm. is stored in fat, and so one of the reasons why African-American women disproportionately suffer with fibroids is in general, they have more body fat than other racial groups. So one of the things we try to get people involved in is eating better and trying to be closer to their ideal body weight through healthy right. choices, exercise, losing that excess body fat. That's very helpful. The other thing is make sure you have appropriate vitamin D levels. Vitamin D, it's not really a vitamin, it's a pro-hormone, but um, vitamin D is your kind of your best anti-fibroid vitamin. And mm -hmm. so that down. vitamin D. Vitamin D. Um, only about 10% of African Americans have adequate vitamin D because we, it has to do with how we get vitamin D. We get it in our, through our skin, um, and so it's absorbed. And the darker the pigment, the harder it is. Um, and so a lot of African Americans have low oh, vitamin we don't, yeah. we don't lie down in the sun and these things, so we understand. <laughs> So check your vitamin D because that can be supplemented. That's not a difficult yeah. thing, and get an adequate level. And that can be your fibroid retardant. I mean, one of them. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That's very important information. People are hoping to write in this down because this is very interesting and this is very important. Somebody asking, just curious for us married people, how does it affect your sex life? He said it already, but I'm sure he doesn't mind saying it again. Well, Usually, um, sex go, you know, can interrupt um, marriages, relationships, because the woman, when she's bleeding so heavily, one, she doesn't feel very sexual wearing diapers and all this extra padding, extra gear. So she doesn't feel very sexual. And plus, the anemia leads to chronic fatigue. Let's face it, sex is exercise. So yes. for, for a number of reasons, kind of sex goes out the window. Um, and so it can really be devastating to relationships, obviously, and particularly if the man doesn't understand it. We love it when men come out to our conferences so they can understand exactly what women go through that are suffering with fibroids, these horrific periods and what it means to them, not only physically, yeah. psychologically. Once you have the UFE procedure, their periods lighten, become normal, they're transformed. The anemia goes away, the weakness and the tiredness go away. They don't have to wear all this heavy gear. They don't have to, everything doesn't revolve around their menstrual. They, oh you know, my gosh. If, oh. They, not, if they have sex or not, if they go to work, if they go to the beach, everything revolves around that darn period. That, that goes away. They get light, normal periods again. And now they feel sexual. They have the energy for sex. So in, in general, after, fiber, after the UFE procedure, sex is improving. In fact, Cynthia Bailey, I can mention this because she has gone public with it. She credits me with giving her her sexy back. Oh, go Cynthia. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, somebody's still asking about can you get pregnant after UFE? Yes, you can. Yes. Somebody else asking what are the risks? Um, they want to talk about risks. What are some of the risks that you can look at? Um, you have to think about when you're looking at a UFP procedure. Obviously, there are risks in any procedure, and it's important to go to an experienced interventional radiologist if you're considering UFE. Um, right. But the risks for an outpatient procedure where a patient will go home the same day with a Band-Aid pale in comparison to the risks of being cut open surgically, whether it's open or laparoscopic or any of the surgical uh, techniques. So right. the the UFE procedure is much, much, much safer than any kind of surgery. But the, the two main risks, one is there are some women that don't menstruate again permanently. Now, that has never, ha I've done 9,000 or so UFEs, supposedly the largest experience in the United States. I've never seen anyone, not a single patient in 
where that happened that was less than 40 years of age. Um, okay. as, as you get above 40, you start to see it. 40 to 45, about 1 to 2%. 46 to 50, now you're talking close to 10%. Over 50, 20, 25%. But obviously, those ladies, as you get older, and include the menopause. not really interested in fertility. In fact, most of the patients that I say, you know, the first risk is you might not menstruate again. It triggers like laughter for about five or 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> Love nothing better than to not menstruate. But, Understood. But Understood. And that are interested in fertility, and it's a longer discussion, and we talk about it. But there are about 5% of women that will temporarily pass some fibroid material vaginally with the menstrual. Totally fine. It's important to know that they could do that. And on rare occasions, we'll need the gynecologist's help to actually deliver some of that material out, but it's rare. Um, you mean deliver, like push it through? Like push uh, it out through the vagina? They, yes, they come in from the vagina, from the cervix, inside, and just deliver it out like a D&C for a miscarriage. Ooh, so you, so you literally have a fibroid baby? Fibroid baby. It's, it's not a <laughs> Yeah. That happens. Wow. I, mean, I didn't people, know that. <laughs> wow, that, that, is, that is interesting. Okay, so, so um, as I was asking before, so there are a lot of persons who don't find out that they have fibroid issues until they're trying to have a baby. And they find out at, at that point that there's something blocking their infertility or something causing them to have some challenges with fertility. So what, what do you think um, from maybe like a percentage wise, how many of these women actually come into you and they, 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 they are desperate and they're like, look, doc, I don't think I can have a child because I've been trying forever and ever and they do this procedure. Can you give us an idea of the numbers? Like how many of them are able to have have baby afterwards? And maybe you want to tell us some 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 nice happy story about some some lady who thought she was at the end of her rope and she had a wonderful miracle baby at the end of it all. Well, there's two different kinds of patients there. There's there's the fertility patient that has a fibroid maybe centrally that's either preventing a woman from getting pregnant or causing her to miscarry. If she has no other symptoms, if it's just a fertility issue, she's not a UFE candidate. Where that's okay. so, so that lady doesn't have any symptoms. It's an infertility, and that's a different matter. We, we wouldn't treat that patient, at least not currently. Um, there is the patient that's coming to me that has significant fibroid symptoms and is also potentially interested, either possibly or definitely interested in children. We will talk mm -hmm. to them. The, the potential for having children. The, you know, patients come to me with all different ages, all different size fibroids. You know, in general, the younger and the fewer fibroids by MRI, not ultrasound, the more myomectomy currently, at least for the first procedure, tends to make more sense. The, the more fibroids a woman has and the older she is, that's where UFE makes a lot more sense than myomectomy. Or if okay. the ever had a myomectomy, the next procedure should always be UFE. There should never be a second myomectomy or a third or a fourth. That's, that just shouldn't happen. Uh, but it happens a lot, unfortunately, because each, yeah. each time they cut on that uterus, the fertility drops. There's a, there's a price yeah. to pay for cutting on a woman's uterus. So um, the, the nice thing about fibroid embolization is it knocks out all the fibroids. And so in general, there's a roughly about 60, a little bit over 60%, 61 and a half percent of women that wanted to have a child, got a child after UFE. And that's pretty good because our patients typically aren't in their 20s. They're usually, right. the average age is like late 30s, 40s. Uh, and so they're older than the 20 year old fertility patients. So getting over 60% of women to have children that wanted them, I think is very, very good. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's very, very good as well. And you're going to tell me about your, your Miracle Baby? Well, the Miracle Baby was a woman, she was in her late 30s when she saw me originally and was pretty horrified because she had gone to her physician who told her to have a hysterectomy and she didn't want it. She was suffering with the typical symptoms from fibroids and he couldn't understand why she didn't want hysterectomy. And she said, well, I might want to be interested in childbearing someday. I just don't know. And he's like, well, you're 38 or 39 and you're single, that ship has sailed, forget about it. 
and she was crushed by all of that. And obviously so. That was very crass and uncaring. Yes. Um, and I told her, you know, I don't know if you're going to get pregnant or not, but I, I am confident I can help you. And let's just start there. And so we, we performed the UFE procedure on her. She went home same day as all of our patients do. She got the relief of symptoms. She did great um, and really got her life back. And then lo and behold, she met a man and they got, they started dating and she ended up marrying him. Um, and I got a letter in the mail that she had a child and she sent me the little baby picture of the miracle baby Jalen. And that was so great. We were like really tickled about that. And I, I kept the picture. Um, and then not long ago, um, I got a knock at the door in my office and it was this woman had come to see me and, you know, it'd been many years uh, since I had done her embolization and she reminded me who she was and said that she had something for me, come outside. So I walked outside the office and the, it, uh, the parking lot out of the car popped Jalen, who had just graduated from high school. Um, wow. Um, thing here. In fact, I don't know if I can, I can show you this. I don't know if, uh, but he, uh, we went into the office and I showed him his baby picture to remind him what he used to look like. And he gave, <laughs> he gave me his graduation uh, high school picture. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn this around, see if I can, let's see. One sec. I'm gonna magnify this up. These are, that's his baby picture. Oh, there he is. Oh, my gosh. Ah. Yes, I see it. I see it. Yeah, so baby picture and grown man picture. <laughs> she had her miracle baby in September of 2001. Uh, I mm -hmm. saw fibroids back in 98. Um, and then, you know, now he's graduated high school. He's on to college. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. Well, you know, um, I just wanted I just wanted everybody who's listening to know what's possible because the truth of the matter is, as I indicated before, UFE is not a popular procedure in Jamaica. As a matter of fact, I'm 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 saying it cautiously because I don't know of it being done here any at all. But I'm really trying to inquire if there's anybody who does it here. And that's the reason why I'm so excited about inviting you to come here and, and, and let's do something with it because I know women right now that I could I could call on who would, would would jump at the chance to find out if they can they can qualify to do this procedure because the truth of the matter is that a lot of women avoid surgery just simply because of what it takes. It it, it, it requires you to have um you know, you need to have time to recover. And for stuff for a lot of us, if we're not working, we're not earning. And right. so that that is that, that is a challenge. So a procedure like this will be a little bit more um, advantageous because there's a very big difference between taking off one week from work versus taking off two months from work to recover right. from a medical procedure. So um, I'm really interested in finding out how, how we can make that happen. And, I'm, and I'm, we, will, we definitely will, I'm sure. But I just, want you to give, I just want to give this opportunity right now to just tell, tell the audience where they can find you. I see some people asking them what they can make an appointment or anything like that so they can come and find out how you can help them with their fibroid issues. Well, we see patients from all over. Um, we, we have a very robust telemedicine solution that we had before the COVID. Now with the coronavirus, we're doing that a lot more uh, for even patients that are in Atlanta. Uh, but we, we do a telemedicine where we can, I can see them just like this. We can go over their imaging. We can talk about their symptoms. Um, and they're only coming to our center just to have the procedure. The consultation and the follow-up can all be done remotely um okay so, uh, so for the person asking about florida he can he can see you remotely so link him just give them the information Dr. Um, my website is atlii.com atlii.com we have a youtube channel atlanta fibroid center um i'm on obviously instagram dr underscore my last name so dr underscore L-I-P-M-A-N. Um, the website has a lot of information on fibroids and on UFE. And the great thing about this story that, that you allowed me to share was that this woman, she, she held her fingers like this. I was this close to getting a hysterectomy and I wouldn't have had my miracle baby. And you yeah. know, any, woman, any woman that has symptomatic fibroids and is told that she has to have a hysterectomy, get a second opinion. No matter what doctor says that, 
you don't have to have hysterectomy. You can get a UFE, see, get a second opinion with a doctor that is experienced with UFE because you don't have to have it. It's an option, but it should be yeah. the option of last resort, not first and only option like a lot I, of I agree. I don't think it's, it should be the first thing that, 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 is, that is put on the table. I think there's a place for it. I think it is important. I think it is necessary. I just don't think that it should be the, the first and only option. And for a lot of persons, it really is. Yeah, because there are consequences. You know, I hear a lot of patients say, well, my doctor said, I'm done having my kids. I don't need my uterus anymore. That's ridiculous. Yeah. The uterus has a lot of important functions for yes. women. Yes! Besides... Oh, thank you so much! <laughs> it, it's insanity. Um, these are benign tumors. There's no reason to do an amputation on the uterus uh, for benign disease that just should not have to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Littman. Um, obviously, you are, you, are, you are a hoot. Give us the website one more time. And, and, and your, 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 his Instagram handle is on, the, is on the live feed. So you can just click on it and you can go directly to his page. Or give us the website one more time. It's Atlanta. It stands, it stands for Atlanta Interventional Institute. That's the parent company of the Atlanta Fibroid Center. So the website is atlii.com. Atlii.com. Awesomeness. Thank you so much, Dr. Littman, and thank you for spending some time with us on your night Sunday afternoon. You can go back to your, your virtual Jamaica trip that you have going on there, find some reggae music play, and go drink a beer, make it a full evening and done. <laughs> I want to listen. I'm going to hang out for, for the conference. I think it's oh, well, well, Absolutely. And I thank you so much for your support. You have been, you have really, really been, been hanging with us since the COVID start, and we really appreciate that. And, and by the hook on the cookie pass to spend Send a banana boat for you. You're coming to Jamaica. All right. Yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> and, and all right. You know, getting this great, you know, docket together. All these people are, are fantastic. Yes, I know. Thank you so much. I'm really, 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 really excited. And, and all of this really in, in, important information is so necessary. And obviously, a lot of persons are going to benefit. So thank you. And continue your good work. Thank you. Information is power. Con absolutely. <laughs> all right. So that was Dr. John Littman. He's all the way in the ATL in his Jamaica shirt. And I'm really, really, really happy that he was able to join us today. And okay. <laughs>